For this segment, we're going to be talking about leukemia. Leukemia is a malignant disorder that affects the blood and blood forming tissues of the body, such as the bone marrow, the lymph system, and the spleen. The white blood cells of the body are usually produced based on the body's needs and in an orderly fashion. With leukemia, abnormal, poor functioning white blood cells are produced. These white blood cells are not able to fight infections effectively. Leukemia was once thought of as a childhood disease, but the disease affects both adults and children. There are different types of leukemia. Some forms are more common in children and other forms more in adults. The disease can be fatal if not treated. There is no single cause for leukemia. Like all cancers, leukemia begins with the mutation in DNA. It is said to be caused by a combination of predisposing genetic and environmental factors. Oncogenes or abnormal genes are said to be the cause of many types of cancers. Environmental causes include chemical agents, chemotherapeutic agents, viruses, radiation, and immunologic deficiencies. Individuals who live near nuclear test sites or nuclear reactor accidents and who works as radiologists are at an increased risk for leukemia. Leukemia is classified as acute or chronic. The first type of classification is by how fast the leukemia progresses. In acute leukemia, the abnormal blood cells are immature blood cells or blasts. They are not able to carry out their normal functions and they multiply rapidly. So the disease worsens quickly and the patient feels sick right away. Acute leukemia requires aggressive, timely treatment. Chronic leukemia, there are many types of chronic leukemias. Some produce too many cells and some cause too few cells to be produced. Chronic leukemia involves more mature blood cells. These blood cells replicate or accumulate more slowly and can function normally for a long period of time. Some forms of chronic leukemia initially produce no early symptoms and can go unnoticed or undiagnosed for years. The second type of classification is by the type of white blood cell affected. In lymphocytic leukemia, this type of leukemia affects the lymphoid cells, which form the lymphatic tissue. A single lymphoid cell clones itself and produces blasts or immature white blood cells. These white blood cells never matures. Cloning of this immature cell becomes uncontrollable and fills up the bone marrow with blasts, which eventually gets pushed into the circulation. This process is called leukocytosis. In myelogenous leukemia, this type affects the myeloid cells. Myeloid cells give rise to red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelet producing cells. The major types of leukemia are acute lymphocytic leukemia. This is the most common type of leukemia in young children. It can also occur in adults. In ALL, small immature cells proliferate in the bone marrow. Most patients will experience fever at the time of diagnosis. Bleeding or fever may occur suddenly or they may experience weakness, fatigue, bone and joint pain, and bleeding tendencies. Acute myelogenous leukemia, or AML, is a common type of leukemia. It occurs both in children and adults. It is the most common type of acute leukemia in adults. It has a sudden and dramatic onset. The patient may have serious infection and abnormal bleeding. AML is characterized by uncontrolled proliferation of myeloblast, myeloblast in the bone marrow.
chronic lymphocytic leukemia, um, also known as CLL, is the most chronic adult leukemia. The patient may feel well for years without needing treatment. It is characterized by an accumulation of lymphocytes that appears to be normal but are functionally inactive, small, and has a long lifespan. As the disease advances, the patient develops complications such as enlarged lymph nodes throughout the body. They may experience pain due to pressure on the nerves. Chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, this type of leukemia mainly affects adults. A person with CML may have few or no symptoms for months or years before entering a phase in which the leukemia cells grow more quickly. This condition is caused by excessive development of mature neoplastic granulocytes in the bone marrow. The clinical manifestations of leukemia relate to problems caused by bone marrow failure and the formation of leukemic infiltrates. The congestion of blasts in the bone marrow causes lymph glands in the neck, axillae, or groin and upper abdominal quadrants to become swollen and painful. Risk for infections increase because these leukemic white blood cells do not mature, resulting in a decrease in the number of mature infection-fighting cells, or neutrophils. This condition is also known as neutropenia. Bone marrow failure also results from overcrowding with abnormal cells and inadequate production of red blood cells and platelets. The patient often presents with signs of anemia such as fatigue, pallor, weakness, and shortness of breath, as well as signs of thrombocytopenia such as petechiae, nosebleed, and easy bruising from the decreased number of platelets. Again, if leukemia is left untreated, it can be fatal, resulting in death mainly from infections. As leukemia progresses, fewer blood cells are produced and abnormal white blood cells continue to accumulate. This accumulation occurs because they do not go through the normal cell life cycle. This is also known as apoptosis. The leukemic cells may infiltrate the patient's organ, leading to problems such as splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy, meningeal irritation, bone pain, and oral lesions. Leukostasis may also occur. This is a life-threatening complication. It is caused by a high leukemic white blood cell count in the peripheral blood. This causes the blood to become thickened and blocks the circulatory pathways. Identifying the type of leukemia is important because the various types have different prognosis and chemotherapeutic regimens. Doctors may find chronic leukemia in a routine blood test before symptoms begin. Through a blood test, the doctor can look at a sample of your blood and determine if you have abnormal levels of red, white blood cells or platelets, which may suggest leukemia. For a bone marrow test, the doctor may recommend a procedure to remove a sample of bone marrow from your hip bone. The bone marrow is removed using a long, thin needle. In a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, a doctor or nurse uses a thin needle to remove a small amount of liquid bone marrow, usually from a spot in the back of your hip bone or pelvis. The second part of the procedure removes a small piece of bone tissue and the enclosed marrow. The sample is sent to a lab to look for leukemic cells. Specialized tests of your leukemia cells may reveal certain characteristics that are used to determine your treatment options. Morphologic, histologic, immunologic, and cytologic methods are all used to identify leukemic cell types and stages. Other studies such as lumbar puncture and CT scan can detect leukemic cells outside of the blood and bone marrow. 
The malignant cells in most patients with leukemia have specific cytogenic abnormalities that are associated with distinct subsets of the disease. The cytogenic abnormalities have diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic importance. Age and cytogenic analysis often help form the basis of important treatment decisions. In some cases, such as non-symptomatic patients with CLL, watchful waiting with active supportive care may be appropriate. Although a patient may not be cured, attaining remission or disease control is a realistic option for the majority of patients. In some cases, cure is a realistic goal. In complete remission, no evidence of overt disease is found on physical examination, and the bone marrow and peripheral blood appear normal. Partial remission is characterized by lack of symptoms and a normal peripheral blood smear, but evidence of disease is still seen in the bone marrow. Minimal residual disease is defined as tumor cells that cannot be detected by morphologic examination, but can be identified by molecular testing. Molecular remission indicates that all molecular studies are negative for residual leukemia. Chemotherapy is the mainstay of treatment for leukemia. Uh, so to get a better understanding, um, you could go over chapter 15 of your Lewis text. In the induction phase, um, this is an aggressive treatment that seeks to eventually restore normal um, functioning on bone marrow recovery. The bone marrow is severely depressed by the chemotherapeutic agents and throughout the induction phase, nursing interventions will focus on neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. The healthcare team will provide psychosocial support for the patient and the family. During the induction phase, after one course um, of induction therapy, approximately 70% of newly diagnosed patients achieve complete remission. It is generally assumed that leukemic cells persist undetected after induction therapy. This could lead to relapse within a few months if no further therapy is administered. In the post-induction phase, this may consist of one or two additional courses of the same drugs given during induction, or may involve high-dose therapy or intensive consolidation. The maintenance therapy in, um, includes lower doses of the same drugs given over three to four weeks. The goal is to keep the body free of leukemic cells. Various therapeutic methods are used to treat leukemia. Combination therapy is the mainstay of treatment for leukemia. The three purposes for using multiple drugs are to decrease drug resistance, Minimize the drug toxicity to the patient by using multiple drugs with varying toxicity and to interrupt cell growth at multiple points in the cell cycle. Some therapeutic drugs are aimed at small molecules that promote the growth and differentiation of leukemic cells. The use of specific therapy in the form of monoclonal antibodies is an important treatment modality for leukemia, but cures for these therapies alone are rare. Other treatments in addition to chemotherapy are corticosteroids and radiation therapy. Total body radiation may be used to prepare the patient for bone marrow transplant, or radiation may be restricted to only certain areas such as the liver and the spleen or other organs affected by infiltrates. Hematopoietic stem cell transplant is used to treat different types of leukemia. The goal of HSCT is to totally eliminate leukemic cells from the body using a combination of chemotherapy with or without total body irradiation. The patient's hematopoietic cells are totally eradicated and replaced with stem cells from siblings or volunteer donor or with the patient's own stem cells or an identical twin. 
Complications with HSCT is infection, leukemia relapse, or graft-versus-host disease, wherein the donor stem cell or bone marrow attacks the recipient. Because HSCT has serious associated risks, the patient must weigh the significant risks of treatment-related death or treatment failure, relapse, against the hope of a cure. HSCT is discussed in Chapter 15. The overall goal of planning um, are that the patient with leukemia will understand and adhere to the treatment plan. They will experience minimal side effects and complications associated with both the disease and its treatment, and they will establish realistic hope and goals, uh, feeling supported during periods of treatment, relapse, or remission. The nurse caring for the patient with leukemia faces a lot of of challenges because the patient has many physical and psychosocial needs. It is therefore important that the nurse understands the patient's type of leukemia, the prognosis, treatment plan, and the goals. The patient with leukemia may have um, other comorbid conditions, therefore um, uh, important nursing interventions should include maximizing the patient's physical functioning, um, teaching the patients that acute side effects of treatment are usually temporary and encouraging the patient to discuss their quality of life. A patient may require a long-term hospitalization or may need to temporarily relocate to an um, appropriate treatment center. This can be um, very challenging, um, causing the patient to feel deserted and isolated. Therefore, the nurse must use um, um, a humanistic approach and also a very caring approach with the leukemic patient. From a physical care perspective, the nurse is challenged to make astute um, assessments and plan of care to help manage the patient's severe side effects of chemotherapy. The nurse should review all drugs that should be administered, including the mechanism of action, the purpose, Routes of administration and the doses, side effects, safe handling consideration, and toxic side effects. The patient and family should be taught about the importance of continued diligence in disease management and the need for follow up care. Also, they should be taught about the drugs, self care measures, and when to seek medical attention. Having the patient involved in um, survivor networks and support groups or services may help the patient adapt to living after a life-threatening illness. Exploring resources in the community, such as the American Cancer Society, the Chemo and Lymphoma Society, may help reduce the financial burden and the feeling of dependence. Also provide resources for spiritual support. The physical therapist may be consulted to help to create um, or develop an exercise program to prevent post-treatment deficits caused by drug-induced peripheral neuropathy. Most patients should receive a pneumococcal vaccine and an annual influenza. These needs can also include other concerns such as vocational restraining and reproductive concerns for a patient of childbearing age. As discussed earlier, um, the expected outcomes for the leukemic patients is that they will um, be able to cope effectively. Um, they will uh, experience no complications as relates to the disease, and they will have comfort and feel supported throughout their treatment. Lymphomas are malignant neoplasms or abnormal cells that divides uncontrollably and destroys body tissues. They originate in the bone marrow and lymphatic structures and results in proliferation of lymphocytes. There are two types of lymphomas, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a comparison of the two types of lymphomas as presented in table 3027 on page 641 in the text. Hodgkin's lymphoma is also called Hodgkin's disease. 
It is a malignant disease characterized by proliferation of abnormal giant multinucleated cells called Reed-Steinberg cells. These are located in the lymph nodes. Although the cause of the disease remains unknown, suspected factors that is thought to play a role in its development include infection with the Epstein-Barr virus, genetic predisposition, and exposure to occupational toxins. The risk of having Hodgkin's lymphoma increases with HIV infection. A normal lymph node is usually composed of connective tissue that surrounds a fine mesh of reticular fibers and cells. In Hodgkin's lymphoma, the normal structure of lymph node is destroyed by overgrowth or, or hyperplasia of monocytes and macrophages. The main diagnostic feature of Hodgkin's lymphoma is the presence of Reed-Steinberg cells in lymph node biopsy specimens. Hodgkin's lymphoma has an insidious onset. In the initial stage of development, the cervical, axillary, or inguinal lymph nodes become enlarged, and a mediastinal node mass is the second most common location. The enlarged nodes will remain um, movable and non-tender and painless unless um, pressure is exerted on the adjacent nerves. The patient may experience weight loss, fatigue and weakness, fever and chills, tachycardia, and night sweats. A group of initial findings including fever in excess of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, drenching night sweats and weight loss, exceeding 10% in six months are termed B symptoms and correlate with a worse, worse prognosis. After the ingestion of a small amount of alcohol, individuals with Hodgkin's lymphoma may complain of a rapid onset of pain at the site of the disease. The cause of the alcohol-induced pain is unknown. Generalized pruritus without skin lesion may develop. Cough, dyspnea, strider, and dysphagia may all reflect mediastinal node involvement. In more advanced disease, there may be hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Anemia results from increased destruction and decreased production of erythrocytes. Other physical signs vary depending on where the disease is located. For example, intrathoracic involvement may lead to superior vena cava syndrome. And enlarged retroperitoneal nodes may cause palpable abdominal masses or interfere with renal function. Jaundice may occur from liver involvement. And bone pain may occur as a result of bone involvement. Evaluation of Hodgkin's lymphoma can be done through the analysis of peripheral blood, excisional lymph node biopsy, bone marrow examination, and radiologic studies. Abnormalities in CBC, such as a microcytic hypochromic anemia, are variable and not diagnostic. Leukopenia and thrombocytopenia may develop, but they are usually a consequence of treatment, advanced disease, or superimposed hypersplenism. Other blood studies may show elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate elevated leukocyte alkaline phosphatate from liver and bone involvement, hypercalcemia from bone involvement, and hyperhalbuminia from liver involvement. Radiologic evaluation can help to define all the sites and determine the clinical stage of the disease. A PET scan with CT scan is used to stage and assess the response to therapy and to differentiate residual tumor Pomfret fibrotic masses after treatment. This diagram is showing us the staging for Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Using diagnostic studies, a stage of disease is determined. Disease may be localized or diffused, and the final staging is based on the clinical stage or the extent of the disease the presence of B symptom and other unfavorable prognostic features. Treatment depends on the nature and the extent of the disease. The management of Hodgkin's lymphoma focuses on selecting a treatment plan with the least amount to achieve cure and minimize short and long-term complications. 
The standard for chemotherapy is the ABVD regimen, which stands for adromycin, bleomycin, vinblastine, and decarbazine. For advanced stage, a common regimen is the BCOP or bleomycin, etoposide, adriomycin, cyclophosphamide, oncovin, procarbazine, and prednisone. Intensive chemotherapy with or without the use of autologous or allogenic HSCT and hemopoietic growth factors is a treatment of choice for advanced refractory or relapsed Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is stages 3B and 4. The role of radiation as a supplement to chemotherapy varies depending on the site of the disease and the presence of resistant disease after chemotherapy. Response to therapy is determined by PET scan and CT scans and other diagnostic tests such as bone marrow biopsy. Hematopoietic stem cell um, therapy has allowed patients to receive higher potentially curative doses of chemotherapy while reducing life-threatening leukopenia. Combination chemotherapy works well because as in leukemia, drugs are used that have an additive anti-tumor effect without increasing side effects. Occasionally, single drugs may be administered palliatively to patients who cannot tolerate intensive combination therapy. A serious consequence of the treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma is the later development of secondary malignancies, as well as potential long-term toxicities from treatment, such as endocrine, cardiac, and pulmonary dysfunction. Patients should have close follow-up and screening for early detection of secondary malignancies, such as lung cancer and breast cancer. These are the most common secondary malignancies for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Nursing care for Hodgkin's lymphoma is based largely on managing problems related to the disease, for example, pain due to tumor, superior vena cava, pancytopenia, and other side effects of therapy, especially those with the skin after radiation. Because the survival of patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma depends on their response to treatment, supporting the patient through the consequences of treatment is extremely important. The prognosis for Hodgkin's lymphoma is better than that for many forms of cancer or leukemia, but psychosocial considerations are just as important as they are with leukemia. The physical, psychological, social, and spiritual consequences of the patient's disease must be addressed. Fertility issues may be of particular concern because this disease is frequently seen in adolescents and young adults. Help to ensure that these issues have been addressed soon after diagnosis. Evaluation of patients for long-term effects of therapy is important. Because, they delay, because delayed consequences of disease and treatment may not be apparent for many years. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are a heterogeneous group of malignant neoplasms of primarily killer cell origin affecting all ages. They are cat classified by the level of differentiation, cell of origin, and rate of cellular proliferation. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the most commonly occurring hematologic cancer and is responsible for 3% of cancer-related deaths. Each year, approximately 70,800 new cases are diagnosed and approximately 18,990 deaths occur. The cause of Hodgkin's lymphoma is unknown. It may result from chromosomal dislocation, infections, environmental factors, and immunodeficiency states. Some viruses have been and viruses and bacteria have been implicated in the pathogenesis of, of the disease. This includes 
For example, hepatitis B and C, Helicobacter pylori, and the human herpes virus A, among others. Environmental factors linked to the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma include chemicals, for example, pesticides, herbicides, solvents, organic chemicals, and wood preservatives. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is also more common in individuals who have inherited immunodeficiency syndromes and who have used immunosuppressive medications, for example, to prevent rejection after an organ transplant or to treat autoimmune disorders or who have received chemotherapy or radiation therapy. There is no hallmark feature for non-Hodgkin's um, lymphoma that is parallel to Hodgkin's lymphoma or the Reed-Steinberg cells of Hodgkin's lymphoma. However, all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involve lymphocytes arrested in various stages of development and may mimic a leukemia. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas can originate outside the lymph nodes. The method of spread can be unpredictable, with the majority of patients already having widely spread disease at the time of diagnosis. The primary clinical manifestation is painless lymph node enlargement. The lymphadenopathy can wax and wane in indolent disease. Because the disease is usually disseminated when it is diagnosed, other symptoms are present depending on where the disease has spread. This disease can also manifest in non-specific ways such as airway obstruction, hyperuricemia, and renal failure from tumor lysis syndrome, pericardial tamponade, and GI complaints. Patients with high-grade lymphomas may have lymphadenopathy and constitutional symptoms or B symptoms such as fever, night sweats, and weight loss. The peripheral blood is usually normal, but some lymphomas manifest in a leukemic phase. Because um, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is more often in extranodal sites, more diagnostic studies may be done, such as an MRI or lumbar puncture to rule out CNS disease, a bone marrow biopsy to determine bone marrow infiltration, or a barium enema, upper endoscopy to visualize suspected GI involvement. Treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involves chemotherapy and sometimes radiation therapy. More aggressive lymphomas are more responsive to treatment and more likely to be cured. Patients with low-grade um, lymphomas may live 10 years or more without treatment. However, some initial therapies can be well tolerated and have been shown to reduce the time to progression of the disease. Lymphomas that have an infectious basis, such as H. pylori gastric lymphomas, may be treated with antibiotic or antiviral therapy. Hematopoietic stem cell treatment may have some benefit to in certain subtypes or of aggressive or refractory lymphomas. Complete remission are um, uncommon, but the majority of patients respond with improvement in symptoms. The nursing care for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is similar to that for Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is largely based on managing problems related to the disease. However, because non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can be more extensive and involve specific organs, it is important to understand the subtype and the extent of the disease. The patient who is undergoing external beam radiation therapy has special nursing needs. The skin in the radiation field requires attention. It is important to include concepts related to safety issues regarding radiation therapy in the plan of care. Psychosocial considerations are also important. Help the patient and family understand the disease, treatment, and the expected and potential side effects. Depending on the extent of the treatment, which may be aggressive, it may require close follow-up and even inpatient admissions. Fertility issues may be of concern in young patients. 
As in Hodgkin's lymphoma, evaluation of patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma for long-term effects of therapy is important because the delayed consequences of the disease and treatment may not become apparent for many years.